For years, you have heard about coal ash in the news, the health effects, the effects on our community. And Caroline Armijo has been involved for many of the years, and actually longer than you've even heard about it, probably on the news, advocating for the cleanup of coal ash spills and the like, and, and actually trying to educate people about it. And that has kind of come full circle because she's also an artist, and now she's the director of the Lilies Project. So we want to know what all this is, but we're going to start kind of at the beginning. When did you first hear the word? coal ash and what did it mean to you at the time? I first learned about coal ash in August of 2010. My friend had a brain tumor and I'd lost several people that I loved that summer. And so I started asking questions. What was at Blues Lake? I knew Duke Energy was there and just started doing research about is there something there that could cause health concerns? And the answer was yes. So um, at the time I was living in D.C. and Earth Justice was doing a campaign to um, identify coal ash as a hazardous material and so once I realized it there were posters all around me of these men this man in a hazmat suit on a lake that looked very much like Blues Lake and um, so I really became involved in it at that point. And so what did that look like? You say involved. What did that mean at the time? Well at the time I was in DC and I didn't really know anyone really how to get organized and so my daughter was a baby and we would literally march around the EPA with um, the Interfaith Power and Light from the area. Um, but Obama did not classify coal ash as a hazardous material and so I just kind of dropped the topic. And it wasn't until 2012 when I moved back to North Carolina, my cousin was diagnosed with a brain tumor at that time and so I knew what to do. I knew I needed to contact a group who was you know, an environmental group, and I reached out to um, Avner Van Gosh, who's a professor at Duke University who had just published a report about coal ash, and he put me in touch with Earth Justice, who put me in touch with Appalachian Voices. So we started organizing there in Blues Creek um, late 2012, early 2013, right a full year before the Dan River spill. Okay, so then the spill happened. Everybody knew suddenly what was in their backyard, so a lot of people came out. We were already there. And um, it just led to a lot of movement in the coal ash problem. So. Right. And so it has really um, just recently kind of come full circle for you yes. because there were plans to now clean it up. Yes. In five years. So that was it just, you know, when we started, when I started in 2010, or actually in 2012 and 2013, we really didn't have any path forward. Mm -hmm. But the Dan River spill really did help facilitate this statewide cleanup because of the camel laws that were put in place. There was a lot of headlines that people knew there were issues with um, contaminated well water throughout the state. And um, so there was just a lot of activity that happened over the last several years. But the, the state had to require Duke to make a decision on the final closure plans, and that was just determined on April 1st. And so they, have, they are enforcing Duke and asking them to clean up all of the coal ash at the six remaining sites out of the 14. So all sites will be cleaned up. Okay, so you kind of feel like this advocacy piece, you've, you've, you've hit this milestone that you're working yes. towards. And now in the midst of that, you actually began another project um, uh, to keep the education going and also to do something for the community where you grew up. Yes, so in early 2017, I saw a call for entry for a National Creative Placemaking Fund grant that asked, do you know how to use art to do something for a public sector? So I immediately thought of, yes, I had been talking to the professors at A&T for a year and wanted to make art out of coal ash, but I didn't know how to ask them. I didn't think that they would really take me seriously. So. Um, it was a sizable grant and so I asked if they would help me with it and they said yes. So then I thought, oh, that's a great video, but I didn't really consider that I would win and so I did win. And um, so last January 2018, we launched the Lilies Project, which ties in a lot of the community heritage and the rich arts of Stokes County. This is based in Monarch Cove, um, which is the largest town in that, in that, that southeastern corner of Stokes County. And um, we've done arts and programming, and it's just been a lot of fun. And it's going to culminate with a public art project. And yes. that's kind of the start of what we're seeing here. 
Yes, so we're gonna. I'm gonna make art out of coal ash, and so I'm still working with A&T University, State University, and also I'm hoping to bring in concrete, which also uses coal ash, and that would allow for some more sizable pieces um, to include in the park. And so we're hoping to include some lilies. Um, so, but we haven't really gotten the final design yet. Okay. So in, so the, the final design, and we hope to be done by the next summer, 2020. Talk about the Lilies Project. What does that mean? Where did that name come from? Jester Hairston was born at Blues Creek where they flooded. That area was known as Little Egypt, and they built Blues Lake in the early 70s for the power station. And he was a, um, he would go around and collect all the spirituals from throughout the South, and he served as a UN ambassador. He was an actor, he was in the TV series Amen with Sherman Hensley, and he also wrote the song Amen that Sidney Portier lip syncs to in The Lilies of the Field. So that reference to The Lilies of the Field is where I got The Lilies Project from. And so you have a, some ideas, and can I talk about what we're seeing here? First, I want to talk about this big block, because this actually was made here in Greensboro. Yes, so this is a block that is was made um, by um, Dr. Shiva Kumar and Wade Brown at a and and it identifies that it's Blues Creek ash. This is 75% coal ash. So it's a lot heavier than um, concrete and a lot smoother. So you can get some really fine details that you don't get in concrete. And this is another piece that is more of a foam base. So it's really lightweight. So they do a lot. They can create a lot of different materials. And they've been working with different manufacturers trying to come up with prototypes for things like crossbars to use on power poles right. or thinking about really large scale applications for DOT sound barriers that actually absorb the sound versus reflecting the sound. and. You know, we have 180 million tons of coal ash in North Carolina, so we need some really large-scale projects as a way to use up the ash. And so a really good way to, to, to make it so in a way that's safe, a way that's yes. usable and safe for people. And so your art really calls attention to that. And so bringing some coal ash into your art is the plan to show people, look, we can do good things with, with what seems like a terrible disaster. Correct, because the safest form of storage for coal ash is encapsulated in a solid form. It prevents it from getting into our water and it prevents it from getting into our air. The concrete industry does already use coal ash, but this is just another form. We have so much ash, we need to use it because eventually landfills leak and fail. I mean, fortunately, this current decision will put all of the ash into lined landfills up out of the groundwater. So that's a tremendous start and really where we had to be to move forward. So, um, but I do think that we need to go back and try to reuse some of this ash because otherwise it's just going to be there forever. And so again, this kind of a mock-up of what the public art project might look like. And what do you anticipate it'll be like, you know, a year and a half from now when you're looking at the finished product, knowing that this cleanup has begun and that people will be not only safer because of it, but inspired by it? Well, I'm amazed and I do think in a year and a half it'll be a tremendous relief. I mean, I've been astonished with all the different elements of the project so far and how wonderful and inspiring they are they have been um and i i don't really have clarity on what the final piece will look like but i'm i'm really excited about it i think it will just i don't know i'll be elated so I well i think a lot of people will will and i know this has really brought the community together in in some really wonderful ways what is the best way for people to keep up with the lilies project where you are and what you're doing I have a website, it's theliliesproject.org, and, so, um, and also you can follow me on Facebook and Instagram as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you for sharing a little bit. We're going to keep up with you, thank and we you. want to be there when this opens, okay? Yes, I hope so. I'm hoping like, to have a marching band, because I want to be so excited. I, I, the whole thing, a parade. Yes, Carolyn, thank you. Great thank job. You. We look forward to it again. Theliliesproject.org is the way to keep up with all that's happening on this project. Singing now the river song The story of a love gone wrong Lessons learned, forgotten
Once 